Uh, hello and welcome everyone to a Lender's Guide to Raising Capital panel hosted by the Canadian Lenders Association. We have a wonderful group of panelists here today and a really great discussion moderated by Karen G. Bugra, the Managing Director at Echelon Capital Markets. So Karen G is going to take us through a panel discussion and then we will be accepting questions live. So as a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time throughout the discussion and hopefully we'll be able to get to them afterwards. Um, and as always, this panel is being recorded and will be emailed out to you all after the discussion today. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Karen G, to kick off the panel. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a very exciting panel to talk about Lender's Guide to Raising Capital. I personally know all the panelists. Um, you know, I've had, I've had the pleasure of dealing with them on structuring transactions, arranging transactions and the like. And I have to say, I, I respect each of these professionals a, a, a great deal. They are uh, pillars into the community of specialty finance. And uh, I think everybody's gonna enjoy the insights they have on uh, navigating the world, world of raising capital on behalf of a lender. So uh, to kick it off, um, my name is Garanjit Bugra. As uh, Danielle mentioned, uh, Managing Director and Co-Head of Echelon Capital Markets. Um, we have the pleasure of being a mid-market uh, investment bank, and one of the focuses that we have is specialty finance, and uh, the relationship with the CLA is near and dear to us. I also sit on the board of the, of the CLA. Uh, but enough about me. I'd like to get into some intros with our esteemed panelists here. Um, let's start off uh, to, uh, well, to the top left of my screen here. Uh, uh, Justin, perhaps we can go with you, and, uh, and we'll, we'll swing around to the rest of the panelists. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, CLA. And I'm very excited about uh, the next hour talking shop with uh, fellow panelists here. Uh, so Justin Limpright, as Karen Jeep mentioned, Managing Director at Maxium, CWB Maxium Financial. Uh, so about five and a half years ago, CWB bought Maxium Financial and really it was uh, kind of their beachhead or exposure east that they were targeting. And so the acquisition certainly made sense. Uh, within Maxium, multiple different verticals. One of them we call program finance, but you know, more commonly known as lending to lenders or wholesale financing, which is somewhat the topic of the day. Uh, within that uh, vertical, we're, we're very industry agnostic. We're, uh, we'll lend to consumers, unsecured, secured, commercial. Uh, generally, you know, at the, I would say direct traditional facility of a, a margin revolving facility, we would look to syndicate after 70, 75 million. But, you know, we really do look to provide products that, you know, expand the range from a million per month originations upwards of 100 million plus. So uh, that's, that's kind of a little bit about us, but uh, I'll pass it back to you. Perfect. Uh, Kevin, do you want to go next? Sure. And again, yeah, thanks uh, to CLA. It's, uh, you know, between Tal and, uh, and Gary and Danielle and the entire team at, at CLA putting together this fantastic panel and really just the, you know, the work they've been doing throughout the, uh, the industry. So special thanks to them. So Kevin Westfall, I'm a vice president at Accord Financial, uh, established in 1978 and publicly traded on the TSX. Accord Financial is known for our asset-based lending solutions, which obviously include uh, lender finance. Uh, we provide facilities uh, up to 20 million with a sweet spot of about one to 10. Uh, so we're kind of known for working with earlier stage businesses, generally being the, uh, the first senior secured or leveraged lender that they're uh, dealing with. Providing generally warehouse and drawdown facilities, just providing that maximum flexibility for, uh, for lenders, primarily in the B2B space secured, um, but are looking in other areas as well. Perfect. Um, Eamon. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you to the fellow panelists and Karen G for moderating and as well as CLA. So my name is Eamon Glavy. I'm representing Enlightened Capital. Uh, a bit about me, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uniquely qualified to speak on the subject matter today. Uh, my last company, uh, I scaled it and I've been through this uh, capital stack uh, gondolet of right from startup to beta, to family office, to my own savings, to bridge financing when I needed it, right up into institutional, and, and, and it's, it's been a, quite the journey. So that was the last company I did, and it was a specialty finance company. It was also a CLA member as well. Uh, we financed home improvements across the country, ever except for Quebec. Uh, the, currently, that portfolio sits over $100 million, 
um, still own it. Big believer in debt. Um, I think we all are on this panel. So, I mean, the advantages of keeping debt or rented equity, so to speak, are vast. But in any event, enough about that. Um, so a bit about the company, Enlightened Capital is a newly established private debt fund. Uh, we have a Schedule One banking group as a partner. We have a war chest that's very well governed. Um, we understand and like the space here, obviously given my background, uh, anything alternative lender, uh, auto, home, credit cards, debt, uh, anything considered alternative finance uh, we like, especially given my background. Um, and the main purpose, when we put this fund together, the main purpose was actually to cater to alternative financiers. And what we do, our sweet spot is seven to 30, $40 million. So just outside of Kevin's box, once the companies are post beta and they have their systems, they have their management team, they're actually ready to get serious and scale, that's where they would call me. And we would put the gasoline in the tank and help get them ready for uh, institutional type lending. So that that sweet spot of 77 to 30, that's that's where we play. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Karen G. Perfect. Last but not least, Kevin. Or sorry, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Karen G. Uh, thanks to CLA for, for having me again. Always uh, enjoy these discussions, um, especially with, with such a great panel today. Um, we BMO has, has been a sponsor of the CLA for, for about three years now. So uh, where we're an avid supporter and, and, and sponsor and, and uh, much like Kevin said earlier, definitely uh, are in line with, with what they're doing for the industry. Um, we, we actually joined when, when these panels were, were still live and in person. So that's how long we've been a sponsor. Um, a, a bit about us specifically, uh, specialty finance at BMO launched in 2019. Uh, I'm, I'm the senior director on the team, which means that I'm responsible for, for originations, underwriting, structuring, uh, seeing deals through uh, credit agreement, through credit, uh, and, then, and then on to kind of funding, and then, and then uh, account manager on our team kind of takes over. So, that, so I'm, I'm involved really on, on the origination side of things. Uh, specialty finance at BMO and the Canadian Commercial Bank started in 2019, but BMO south of the border and, and uh, BMO Harris Bank has been lending uh, to lenders for, for decades now. I think it started in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, so we benefit from a, from a breadth of knowledge with our, with our U.S. counterparts. We confer with them all the time. We share policies and procedures, uh, credit adjudication, things, things of that nature. Um, our, our asset classes are, are kind of like everyone said, uh, somewhat agnostic. Uh, we, we favor um, secured debt, so that, that's kind of mortgage lenders, equipment lenders, uh, uh, auto lenders, but then we'll do things like, like small business lending, consumer finance, uh, factoring, uh, merchant cash advances, so, so things like that. Uh, our, our sweet spot is, is generally north of 25 million. We, we can hold um, quite large sizes, pr probably north of 100 million. Uh, over that, we, we generally like to syndicate. Uh, our clients range in size, uh, assets, under manage of, as, assets under management of, I would say, about 50 million to, to north of a billion dollars. Um, and, and then my background, so I've been with the bank since 2019. I spent seven years at, at the Equitable Bank before that in a commercial uh, real estate underwriting. Uh, I manage their, their um, large commercial book and, uh, and I managed a specialty finance portfolio for a while. And I started at TD Commercial Bank uh, back in 2010. Back to you, Karen G. Great. I'm sure everybody would agree that we have a lot of experts on this panel. So um, let's get right into it. You know, a little over a year ago, um, I was part of a panel with for the CLA as well. And we talked a lot about capital formation at that time. But at that point in time, we were in the depths of COVID. We still are a little bit, of course, in COVID. But we see the light at the end of the tunnel now uh, with reopenings, with vaccinations uh, in full tilt. Uh, you know, first question open to the group. Um, how do your respective loan portfolios look at this time? And what is your outlook on the specialty finance industry as a whole? Um, for that question, I'd like to start off with Chris first, if that's OK. Perfect. Um, so so probably a little counterintuitive. I, I know we're kind of in the midst of COVID or, or emerging out of COVID, but, but what we're seeing is, is actually record low loss and delinquency rates. Uh, we think that's a function largely of, of some of the stimulus in the market. 
um, be, because there's so much government stimulus kind of propping up customers and, 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 and underlying um, businesses. We, th we think that that might be short-lived, uh, especially as, as, the, as the stimulus kind of wanes from the market. So I would say in terms of, of outlook, if we're, if we're going there, um, we think things might normalize and, and loss and delinqu delinquency rates and things of that nature could, could increase um, in the kind of short to medium term. Um, other than that, I mean, what, what we saw kind of in, in the midst of COVID and, and just coming out of it is, is, is lower, um, lower utilization rates. And again, probably similar, uh, largely due to some of the, uh, the government stimulus out there. Maybe folks are just, just um, generally nervous about taking on additional debt at, at a time where, where the outlook was, was a little more uncertain. Um, but we are seeing those, those increase over time. Um, I mentioned earlier that that we like we like um, secured uh, secured debt, and and that means that that we generally like the the mortgage space. We like things that are real estate secured. Our our portfolio happens to be heavily weighted in in the real estate space, um, and and as likely mo most folks listening here know, uh, real estate's been on a tear for for the last well decade really, but but even through COVID. And, and so we, we've seen anybody as, that's a real estate lender, both on the residential and commercial side, uh, consistently looking for upsizes, new, new capital, equity investments, things of that nature. So we've seen the, the real estate side just, just really explode again, like for, for the last couple of years, but really through COVID. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. And, and that, that's basically where, where I'm seeing right now. Justin, would that be similar to... Uh... To how you're seeing things at CWB? Yeah, very similar. It's it is as Chris mentioned, counterintuitive. I think record low delinquencies, default rates. You know, a lot of our ratios do have a uh, uh, part of the ratio would be on the origination side. So there, I would say, uh, there's being they're being buoyed there a bit because the originations have been down. Uh, and I like our our expectation would be that some of these ratios do come up as the stimulus does wean. However, I don't think that we'll see necessarily approaching back to pre COVID levels. I think a lot of lessons have been learned by the originations, the servicers, the originators. So I think they're going to use that as well to, as they come out of this and be a little more cautious and be a little more targeted with, um, with their selection. Um, Overall, I think we're still obviously bullish in the specialty finance space. So uh, I, I do I do like the the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, now you know kids age five and up are eligible for vaccines. So there's just even more light just coming out of this. So hopefully that continues and there's no more no more hiccups. <laughs> yeah, you know, Kevin, uh, over to you. You know, uh, you're you're kind of on the a little bit on the earlier stage of originators, uh, generally speaking, than say. A CWB or or a uh, or a BMO. Um, so for your partner originators that you work with, you know, what have you seen uh, over the last little while as things are opening up, and you know, how bullish are you in terms of the near term outlook? Well, kind of just dovetailing on to uh, Justin and Chris's uh, comments on um, on continuity and, and and kind of really just uh, the origination side. Um, we've seen kind of a a drop in just greenfield uh, volume. So some of our originators have just kind of stumbled along with uh, stimulus money that's been available in the system. Um, we're, we still remain bullish on the uh, on the lender side. We start to see things kind of coming back. As Justin noticed, as uh, stimulus starts to wean, wage subsidy, rent subsidy are slowing, uh, BCAP, HASCAP slowing down. So generally on our end in that kind of one to 10 space, when people are coming out looking for liquidity, rather than kind, kind of coming to our, our lenders or our profile of financing, then being able to obtain you know, the, um, the stimulus type funding. So as that weans and slows, we start to see, uh, I think, an increase in, in originations and volume. Uh, from a credit perspective, again, kind of just reiterating that uh, that we've seen still that 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 steady that steady flow. So so we, things have been propped up, and we'll see uh, we'll see what the new year brings. Fantastic. Well, Eamon, you're in a different spot. You launched a whole new platform during COVID, <laughs> so uh, and you're just in the in the beginning stages of of putting out capital. Um, so obviously you must be bullish on the industry in, in general, but how are you playing it, particularly as we're entering into reopening and, and uh, vaccines are full tilt? Yeah, thank you. So again, I agree with, with, this, with, the, with the earlier comments of, you know, the stimulus is artificially propping up a number of companies. Um, so if you work that into your analysis before you're, you're getting into deployment of capital, you should be fine. But I think the bigger 
uh, uh, factor and the reason why we're we're bullish pretty much all of us here on this panel is that you know we're bullish on good companies on well-managed firms and companies that know what they're doing um you know if there needs to be some disaster recovery or or some kind of restructuring uh it probably would have it seems would have busted off by now and if they haven't we're anticipating that to start happening six months from now but again, we dig more into the management and the underlying practices of the company. And if we believe in that, they should be fine to weather these storms. I, I love the uh, the term that you used, Eamon, rented, rented equity, I think you used before. It's I was at recently at a conference and they're more early stage kind of startup companies, but uh, all the talk, the, a huge theme was anti-dilutive capital. So, you know, that's kind of a space that we all play in. So especially these companies that are looking, you know, three years down the horizon and thinking, okay, do I have some type of big exit and can I rent some equity now? Uh, it's a, obviously a reason why I think we're all bullish on the space. Agreed. Agreed. That's great. That's great. So, you know, all of you mentioned about the stimulus, right? And uh, arguably the stimulus has been masking uh, the potential defaults and the, and the, you know, the, the rise in delinquencies and the like and the like. But, you know, taking it a step further, and we saw this with, with some of our prospects and some of our clients in, in our practice, you know, a lot of our clients were suffering from lower originations during COVID and still are in, in some subsectors. You know, as we know with, with uh, you know, with the originator, uh, they need to have a certain pace of originations in order to pay for overhead, in order to have certain uh, op costs covered. So, so it has been a challenging time it's one thing to say that maybe your capital is not put to use, in which case, if you're a bank like BMO or CWB, you know, you're collecting your standby fees. But when they're hurting and they can't pay for overhead, how have you been able to actually support their portfolios and support uh, their operations? You know, this is kind of getting into the relationship side of things with uh, with your clients. Uh, for that, I, I'd like to start off with Kevin, if that's okay. I'd say luckily we haven't found ourselves in the space. I mean, again, because just the, the the size and scale that we're working with generally with that kind of, you know, first capital in or the first senior leverage, um, so to speak, we, um, our, our clients don't have the type of overheads and, and generally burn that some of the larger clients might. Um, so I guess luckily we've been in the space where we haven't experienced it. Um, sort of thing. So most of our clients have, you know, are, are able to kind of keep up with the level of originations and so on, and kind of remain profitable through the uh, through the entire scope of the pandemic. That's great, Justin. Yeah, I, I, like I think you, the word you, you mentioned relationships, and I think so much of this was about you establish these relationships and you try to maintain and build these strong relationships, and that's from borrower to lender and lender to borrower, and, and you try to develop those in good times and normal times so that when something happens like a COVID that you have that open communication. And so I could say, I'm sure most of us in March, 2020, were constantly on the phone and, and talking with our clients and trying to get them through it and going through modeling and sensitivity and all types of different things. And that was kind of most of our days and in, in speaking with originators and servicers, but, you know, luckily, um, you know, in, in many of our portfolios, we have what we call perfect pay. So, you know, they were looking to offer deferrals to their customers. And in turn, they were asking us to also offer deferrals. And so there was a matching of cash flow interest there. And so we, we tried to do a lot of that to help out our clients. You know, we were fortunate enough that we could sponsor some, um, some clients for a BCAP loan through EDC. So we, we offered those up as well. And, you know, thankfully enough, defaults were not as high as, as most thought they would be. And so uh, the BCAP loan was largely a, an insurance policy. And, you know, I would say that most of those have been fully repaid at this point. So, um, you know, even though low originations, yes, but I think, you know, defaults weren't as high because of a lot of the stimulus that we, we thought. And so while lots, lots of companies took out these insurance policies or, or really, you know, stressed their portfolios to the, what if this happened? Thankfully, the worst case scenario, I would say for most did not happen. That's great. Chris, what did you, uh, what did you see? Honestly, I, I think Justin nailed it. We, we, we did virtually everything he just said. So, so BMO's a, a bit top heavy. So we, we were on kind of weekly calls with senior management, senior management 
was was keen on on understanding i would say two things first on on positioning the bank in in with our clients that we were on on solid ground that we were well capitalized nothing nothing to fear but but second were, were there were there any cracks right like what what were the underlying what were our underlying portfolio companies seeing facing what did they need so so just like justin on the phone with all of our clients kind of immediately um try, trying to see where where they needed help whether it was whether it was BCAP, whether there was a covenant breach that we needed to, to waive or, or amend the terms. Uh, we, we, we were doing all those exact same things. Um, I, I really, almost nothing to add. I, I think Justin nailed it, frankly. Great. Um, even, I'm not sure if you, if, if you found yourself into a situation like this just yet. Um, oh, yeah, or yeah. Yeah, okay. happy, happy to speak to it. So in the business community, I deal with a lot of business leaders um, and even the portfolios that, that we still own and, and manage. Uh, the really great business leaders were able to <clears throat> lean out. Look, I mean, COVID paused the world. So a lot of the leaders, okay, step back. What's going on? Okay, how can we lean out our operation? Now we need to pull every lever possible or find levers where we didn't even know existed before and maximize uh, uh, shareholder value, right? How are we going to get better? How are we going to drive more value from this business? And every single business leader I know that had a good business was able to become more profitable through this. Now, with the exception of certain industries, they just got slaughtered, like you know, hospitality, for example, or, you know, the restaurants. So they got murdered, right? The gyms got slaughtered too. But everybody else that had a, a pretty solid, stable business to begin with was able to come out of this uh, better for going through it. So let's dovetail on that because um, obviously COVID has changed our lives forever. And our outlook on how we see businesses and how we see um, their performance um, is going to be put through a lens of, well, what did we experience during COVID? So the question is, how are you going to be COVID proofing your loan portfolios going forward? Nobody has a crystal ball, uh, but whether we're thinking about sectors that you may prefer over others, subsectors that you may prefer over others, or is there some structuring terms that you're thinking about in putting into credit agreements or how you're structuring deals or diligence um, that you're thinking about that you're gonna be doing that you didn't do really before uh, COVID. How has your underwriting of transactions uh, changed uh, as a result of the uh, COVID? Sorry, I've muted myself before I said, Kevin, if you want. No worries, no worries, no worries. Um, listen, I mean, it, it, it's kind of an interesting landscape. I don't think anybody ever would have planned for an event like COVID. Um, so obviously it has uh, some pretty significant impact on a go forward basis. Um, so you'll dig a lot deeper into projections and financial modeling, uh, stress testing and reviews uh, and so on. So everything just kind of gets cast in a different light. I think you're going to have your short term, medium term, longer term, you know, types of views like anything. So coming out of COVID and going back in, you know, you'll, you'll have just kind of that uh, taste in your mouth still and, and kind of go through some processes and, and take a little bit, you know, of a, of a longer look, maybe, you know, lower advance rates and so on, uh, commensurate uh, with certain industries and sectors. Um, and then kind of, you know, medium term that starts to wean away. Um, part of that is maybe driven by uh, capacity and capital and competition in this space. Um, for us, certainly we've never wavered um, from our platform and in, in, in our process um, sort of thing. So all we've done is really kind of tighten the bolts a little um, and I'm sure, like I said, that'll have a short term, medium term uh, lasting effect and longer term. I think it just kind of plays out uh, back into more normalized uh, situations. Chris, uh, has the bank gone full tilt in terms of uh, COVID MAC clauses and the like? <laughs> um, kind of. <laughs> um, I, I mean, so, so, so a, a bunch of things and, and uh, I think I think Kevin hit on it, right? But 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 in our structures, we we tend to be a bit more conservative, where we think there might be more of a of a risk of of industries that are going to be impacted by COVID. To, to Iman's point earlier, right? So some some of the hospitalities, anybody that that's financing a gym, for example, obviously we're going to be a little more cautious. But but yeah, for sure, like like pe people were were nervous. Of, out the gate and 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 we saw a lot of credit facilities just being drawn for the sake of being drawn 
right? And 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 and, and so you, you can't have all your clients kind of draw on the facilities. It's 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 a, a quasi run on the bank in in, in an almost inverse way. So so yes, to, to your point, uh, Karen G, like cash hoarding clauses have have been now been invented, right? You, you can't just draw on a credit facility unless you're going to use it for the intended purpose within a specified amount of time. So that that's something that, that we now include in in all of our our credit agreements. Um, lower leverage profiles where where we see fit and 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 again, as as Kevin noted, those things can can step a little more cautious with with utilizing debt. Um, maybe a little more equity in in deals. So so higher tangible net worth clauses are are something that that we like to see um, potentially where where we wouldn't normally ask for it, but but external support. So maybe that's that's a, a corporate guarantee or a personal guarantee. Uh, again, that that might drop off over time, but but just in in uh, in in kind of that that first year to to year and a half runway, make sure uh, think things are stable. Um, we 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 fund a lot of of funds. We we lend to a lot of funds, and and funds tend to have that risk of redemption. So so we're extra cautious on on redemptions now. So we'll we'll put in um, redemption uh, restriction clauses, uh, whether they're they're quarterly redemption restrictions or or trailing twelve month redemption restrictions. But we do want to keep an eye on that. So so we'll we'll usually toggle between kind of a tangible net worth covenant and a redemption covenant, uh, depending on on what's what's more kind of uh, bespoke to the deal. Um, ratios, of course, right? Like, like maybe higher coverage ratios, uh, FCCRs, things of that nature at the gate. Um, and, and then lastly, I'd, I'd say maybe even shorter terms. So, so maybe we were comfortable with, with three, four year terms before those, those are likely shorter, maybe two, three, even one year terms, just to make sure that, that, uh, we have visibility to the, to the profitability and performance of the underlying portfolio company. Great. Uh, Justin Eamon, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I, I think Chris hit most of those uh, uh, bank heads uh, headlines that uh, would typically add to a to a security agreement. But I mean, I don't think we specifically shut the door on any industries. But then again, we're we're lending to lenders, so we're also relying on them and their expertise and their boots on the ground and their ability to say, you know what, we're not going to do restaurants right now, but we're we're going to do this, and we're not going to do gyms, uh, but we're going to do this. So. There's a lot, uh, I mean, not to harp back on the relationship side of things, but it's having that uh, constant communication and trust in them and their abilities as well in their underwriting uh, to get there. We, we, uh, we had an interesting, I'd say portfolio-wise, uh, diversification just came to the fore. And you know, while you know, we do have some auto exposure and while performance was okay, originations, you know, dealerships were closed and then they were open and then there was semiconductor issues and then there's supply chain issues and all the rest of it. So their originations for them have been a challenge, but, you know, on the flip side, we also have some exposure to recreational assets. Well, now no one's traveling internationally. So they're all at home. They're, they're forced or wanting to take vacation. A lot of that vacation is domestic travel or domestic leisure. So you know, boat sales, recreational assets, pop-up trailers, tow behind trailers, all that exploded. So, you know, our portfolio shift has uh, has happened and a lot of that diversification it helped on the origination side. But um, yeah, I guess speaking back to, to Chris's, as far as uh, covenants and protection of the portfolio, I would say diversification. And then there's a lot of those upfront covenants and triggers. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, uh, I think Chris covered all the fun legal exciting stuff for us i think the only thing i would i would add and just to build on on kevin's point there is i mean if one thing has become clear is is that there's a greater need for for a higher cadence of of monitoring uh, and communication is really vital not just you know when it goes sideways but like on a regular monthly monitoring basis not just okay all the portfolio numbers look good but you know sometime you know having and it also depends on it's industry specific too, right? There's some industries like cannabis and, um, you know, we have some exposure there and, you know, but we have a different type of loan product for that sector. And depending on the industry and how fast it can swing, you know, we'll want to have boots on the ground to go check out the facilities or go do a site visit in higher cadence than we normally would. Right. So it's, it's industry specific. So if you're signing up your industries properly, uh, you should set your monitoring and we do accordingly to industry swings, right? And that's the only thing I would add. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm tired of talking about COVID. It's too it's too much of a downer. <laughs> let's uh, let's try to be a little bit more glass half full, if we will. Um, Want to talk about how how as originators uh, are supposed to raise capital, uh, which is really the crux of this conversation today. Um, I guess the first question would be, and we get this a lot as advisors, when is the right time for a company to raise third party institutional capital? So, you know, typically a lot of the uh, newer originators are funded by family and friends or, you know, bootstrapped, if you will, but they want to take that leap and to get third party institutional capital. And all of you provide that at different stages of the life cycle of the company. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it would be great to kind of hear your thoughts, Kevin, and maybe uh, Eamon, you can you can dovetail onto that. Yeah, for sure. As I mentioned, I think we are kind of on the on the smaller scale. Generally, one of the the first senior lenders um, of, of certainly of our clients, uh, we have been the first senior lender. Um, so we kind of look for those three, you know, pretty traditional pillar, um, which would be capital, performance, and profitability. Um, so as you as Karen, you mentioned, um, you know, bootstrapping with friends and family money, uh, EMD channels. Um, sub debt and all kinds of other forms, um, some dilutive, maybe others that are not, but high coupons. Um, we kind of come in and provide that that warehouse revolving facility based on those three key points or pillars. So essentially, once you've kind of gotten through that burn rate or burn stage, you know we won't burn, we won't continue to, to finance the continued burn of the portfolio, so to speak. But once it's kind of reached that platform of profitability, is is when we can start to take a look. Great. And then Eamon, you know, when you take that and apply it to, you know, you, you've gone through this as an originator yourself. What, in your view, is the ideal journey that an originator should follow? Cool, perfect world. You have an idea, you, six months later, you sell it for a billion dollars. But in the reality, look, that's not most business. Are you saying right? that you did that? I, I just want to be clear on that. Are you saying you did that? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I, st I started, I can tell you the whole story, but the short of it is, I mean, look, it was, it was painful, right? I mean, you learn and you get better as you go. So when you start out, it's an idea in your head and you kind of see a gap in the marketplace and then you need capital to try and build your brand and, and start to get going. Right. And, you know, you use your savings to kind of do that. And then you, you know, you, you start to create your brand and you kind of have an idea of what systems you need and, and how to structure this thing. And I guess the painful part, just to kind of preface all that, is that nobody actually teaches this stuff. There's no lending school. Hey, this is how you run a finance company. This is how you start it. You know, so, so kudos to the CLA for putting out some educational uh, material like this to, to, to help other lenders. So going back to the story, you start with your own money, you have an idea, you have to beta it somehow, you put your systems in place, get the thing going. I was brokering in the beginning, just so I didn't go broke. And then um, I brought in some really strategic advisors, uh, people not unlike Karen G, um, and said, hey, you know, I have this idea. How do I get to, you know, this, you know, institutional $100 million type portfolio status? And um, went out, sought really good legal counsel really good accountants and under advice of uh, between the advisors, the, the legal and, and the accounting. Okay, well, this is what you need. This is what your company has to look like. And then I reverse engineered it from there. So the advisors go out, seek advice. You know what, to any lenders that are, that are getting going or starting to scale, guys, don't be afraid. Pick up the phone, call any one of us. I'm happy to spend, and I do this all the time. Uh, I'm happy to spend 15, 20, half an hour on the phone just advising you on what you, what you got to do, you know, call, pick up the phone, call a Karen G, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Cause I, there is no school for, for, for going through that. So your I'm comments, lucky. cause I've had a bunch of our clients that have started early off that we probably had a conversation six months to a year in advance of them actually being ready um, to take on some leverage and so on. So it's a, uh, so great points there for sure. You know, it happens all the time. There's a, yeah. there's a health tech guy I talked to in the summertime. I said, look, this is what you need. This is how you got to structure this. Is what you actually got to look like. And then come back and see us. We'll start talking about doing a deal. Six months later, he's at our door. We're talking about doing a deal. Right. So, so pick up the phone. So and as you can start with your savings, you start to broker, and then you go on to the family office. You start to proof your concept. You're post beta. You start to get, or you start to realize something. And then you call Kevin and you get some money or some family office, you get some money. And you, you, then you start to really uh, fine tune your systems and your processes and procedures. And then you actually bring in like a heavy hitter. You don't need 
you know, massive law firms. You don't need a Blake's day, you know, one for your company, but you need a decent mid-sized firm, right? You need somebody that any one of these lenders on this panel can take serious, right? You can't have, and there's nothing wrong with them, but like the single operator in, in his own office, you can't, we need redundancy. We need law firms we're going to be comfortable with. Um, and they won't clog up your deal. They won't mess it up for you. Um, Cause that can happen too. So none of us will deal with anybody who's not dealing with a mid-level law firm. Uh, same thing for accounting. You got to get your accounting in place, uh, have recognizable brands. You know, nobody's going to deal again with the same kind of one-off uh, accountant. Um, we need confidence uh, in, in that too. So now you have, you've passed beta, you start to make some money, you know, you might be paying, you know, high teens at this point. And then, then you bring in somebody like, like enlightened capital, and then we drop your cost of capital significantly help advise you up until scale. And really, then it's really cutting your teeth and getting really good at running your practice. Um, and then, you know, then what happens is, so really the pivotal points to get advice are in the beginning. So once you're in beta and once you're at scale, then you again, circle back 1000% circle back with a, with a Karen G and say, Hey, now I really want to, you know, liquidate, or I want to monetize this business, you know, how is it? How, and they'll run you through that process. Uh, they're very good at doing it. Um, and, and they'll actually go out and, and reverse engineer the, the monetization of the business. But, um, uh, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. And whether that monetization is is going to institutional type money or or IPO or or sale altogether, again, that's that's something that's a personal preference. And and you know, you and your advisors will will have to make that decision when the time comes. So I hope that helps. Uh, very much so. And I think it leans right into uh, where I'm going to take it next. I you know, so you're at that stage where you've scaled up to a certain degree. You've you proof of concept has been established. Um, you know, you, you got your book at a certain level, but you're generally maybe at a little bit of higher cost of capital. Uh, but the unit economics look good and really just becomes a, a fuel to the fire situation. And, uh, you're ready to really scale it to the big leagues. And, and that's where you may pick up the phone and call, um, a Justin or a Chris. Um, so I want to take it there when we're thinking about bank financing, um, you know, the, the lower cost of capital providers, if you will, the bigger checks um, where you can, you can really help a business uh, grow to a, a significant size. You know, what are the key things that you're looking for? Um, you know, what are the key attributes of success that make you, make you pound a table and say, this is the deal that I want to get done? Um, I'd like to start with Justin first. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, follow off on uh, Eamon's comments, but a, a couple of shout outs, but like is someone who has an advisor, that someone who's coming with an advisor, someone who has an existing facility with an accord or an enlightened capital, that's, you know, that's a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the due diligence that, you know, we're going to piggyback off of. They, they have their lawyers set up, they have their accountants, all of that. That's obviously beneficial. Um, you know, that gets you into that. Here's a fully populated data room with, all of the information that you would need in order to underwrite a deal. Um, we, we do stray a little bit in that we're ne not necessarily pure balance sheet lenders. So we, we do need an originator who knows their industry in and out. Uh, we don't always fall back on someone who has a track record or a business that's been in business for 10 years. Uh, we will get into some earlier stage companies, but you know, the founder or owner operator has to know their industry in and out and be able to teach it to us. You know, we're relying on you, your lenders as well. Uh, we're piggybacking off of a lot of your expertise. So um, for us, a lot of our security does come down to particularly one of our structures into understanding the underlying cash flows of the consumer or whoever is ultimately paying, uh, paying for the loan payment on the, uh, the final consumer level. So uh, balance sheet is obviously nice, but we are doing a lot of our structuring and underwriting to that and stressing and modeling and uh, working with that, that cash flow at the, at the ground level. So, um, you know, understanding the predictability of those cash flows. Do you have some performance, some delinquency data? Do you have some default data? All of that's great stuff, great stuff to know. And, um, you know, a, a properly populated data room uh, with Echelon is obviously helpful and gets us across many it ticks a lot of boxes for us. That's for sure. 
Chris, anything to add there? I, I mean, that nailed it, of course. The, the, the simpler it is for, for the lender, the, the, the better. So when, when I say lender, I mean myself, right? So when, when you bring us a deal, Karen G, right? A nice populated data room and, and quick answers and things like that for, for sure helps. I, I, I think the, the funny thing is, at least what I'm finding, especially recently, like in this kind of 2021 period with, with so many lenders flush with capital, is there's, there's often overlap in where all of us play. Right, like where where CWB Maxim and, and Accord and Echelon and BMO play, and, and you'd be surprised more than not that 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 maybe BMO is is earlier on than you think, and CWB and and, and all, all, all different iterations of that. So, I, th I think the story is is huge, and and to Justin's point, like you'd be surprised where where some of the bigger lenders play earlier on than you'd expect. And, and, and there's reasons for that, right? Like the, sometimes it's, it's, it's just phenomenal management that you've seen do this over and over again, right? Like if just Jeff Bezos came to us with a startup lending uh, organization, we'd probably all put our hand up and say, sure, like, I don't care what it is, like we'll, we'll finance you, right? But so, so I, mean, I mean, the management, the sponsor is, 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 a, big, is a big thing. If, if there's deep pockets supporting, supporting a startup, may, maybe, maybe a, bigger, a bigger lender would, would, would start earlier. Um, but but when, when you're kind of just talking your your run of the mill um, kind of niche lender that that's looking for capital, I, I I think Justin nailed it right. Like like we we need to look at your historical data. We're we're pretty plain vanilla. Where where the bank likes to see three years of positive track record. We need to see a strong equity base. Uh, we need to see kind of by and large a, a positive uh, earnings uh, or at least revenue trajectory. Uh, margins that that are satisfactory, uh, th things of that nature. So, so I mean, again, I think I think there's overlap, but but by and large, um, financial performance is, is something that BMO weighs that very heavily, and then and then management sponsorship. Fantastic. That's uh, that's great. Um, I have one more question that we're going to run through, but just in advance of that, I want to make a reminder to everybody that if you do. Uh, have questions for our esteemed panelists here, please put them into the Q&A um, chat box if you can. And uh, we have reserved time at the end of the, the uh, structured part of this panel uh, to, uh, to answer those questions as best as we can. We'll try to get, as, get to as many as we possibly can. So um, last question, and uh, you know, I wanna make sure that this is a doozy as much as possible. What are the common pitfalls that you have seen uh, as far as originators trying to seek capital? And uh, a prize is going to be given to one that has the best story. Uh, so I, Eamon's already smiling, so I know he has something great. Uh, let's, uh, let's go with him first. No, no, I'm going to keep you all in suspense. I'll go last. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, who wants to go first? I'm I'm happy to chime in. I mean, it's I, I don't know if there's a, a specific story, and I'll leave a little bit more time for Eamon because I know he's got a good story, uh, sort of thing. But I, I think it's you know some of the challenges is just people just not being ready. Um, so it's just kind of you know just not access to data, or as you know Chris mentioned about uh, you know just questions to answers and so on. And again, I mean we don't propose to be uh, you know lending experts in your field. Um, you know we're here to finance your business, not undertake and perform your business. Um, so to speak. So, you know, coming through advisors kind of always helps, that's for sure, access the next data rooms and and really just getting the lay of the land. Now, that being said, I mean, and, and again, as, as even and I had noted earlier, is that we, we get a lot of people that approach us early on or in early days and and really just help kind of, you know, light the pilots for, you know, future uh, discussions and considerations and so on. So I've spoken with, you know, who are clients now, probably a year before they were ready. And, you know, we, we don't, we certainly don't throw them out or cast them aside in, in any ill vein. It's, you know, it's not ready. Here's why, here's what we need. You know, you keep continuing down that track record, um, so to speak. So it's just, it's more so just the, the companies that come just with bad information or no real data uh, and so on. That's just not well organized, I guess, is the, the, the pitfalls in, in what we see. We often see this and, and, um, and we always give the advice to our clients that, you have one chance of making that first impression, you know, because, I, and, and I know with all, all of you, the four of you, you see a lot of transactions uh, come across your desk. And, uh, and to be quite honest, you know, if the first impression is not a good impression, you know, it, sometimes it could be the last impression. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's the advice we always give to our clients is that you want to make sure that 
that uh, you, you you walk in with the right shoes on. Um, you know, Justin, I'm sure you have something. You know what? I don't have uh, too many bad war stories, but I think Kevin hit all the points on the head, like just not not being ready, um, you know, undecided. Are we, are we raising debt or sorry, taking on debt? Are we raising equity? What is our approach? Are we just fishing for some terms uh, to then take back? What are we really doing? I, I think most of the pitfall or some of the pitfalls at least are probably a little earlier stage. So I think, you know, between yourself and Kevin and Eamon, you're probably seeing a few more of those pitfalls, but um, yeah, I don't have too much to add to, to what Kevin said. Chris, anything from your side? Otherwise, we're we're you know really itching to hear Eamon's story. <laughs> <This is nice. laughs> Chris, are you? Oh, um, Chris might be frozen there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Eamon. You know what? I think I'm gonna save that story for a night out over <laughs> maybe at an industry conference or something. Um, but I'm not being recorded in the public masses. Um, fair, fair enough. You know what? Yeah, Kevin really touched it. I mean. It, it's doing the right things, right? Get good advice. But then I'm going to speak to the frustrating part as somebody that deploys capital. I'm sure we all have the same frustration. Like if we say we need something, we need something. We're not, we're not saying it lightly. We're not, we're not asking for it. Like, Hey, please do. No, no. If we need this, we need this. That's all there is to it. If you need proper account, you need proper account. There's no way around it. There's no, like, you know, like you got to pay the play. And I say that sitting on both sides of the fence. I had to pay all the way coming up. I had to pay the legal fees. You got to pay the accountants. You got to pay the advisory fees. You got to pay to play. You need the right advice. You got to be positioned properly. Don't cheap out on trying to scale and build a behemoth company, right? And on the other side too, yeah. I mean, now that we deploy into those companies, nothing's more frustrating than somebody trying to, you know, cut a corner or, or cheap a way around a, this or that. Like, just, it just drives us nuts. Just, just, just don't do that. I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Well, that's uh, great advice, um, and I can certainly concur with a lot of that. Um, let's get to some audience questions. Uh, there has been a decent amount of them, so uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So uh, the first one is an interesting one. It's actually a question relating to um, the effects of inflation to our industry. Um, so as we're thinking about you know, a higher inflation environment, uh, dovetailing with that government stimulus to comments that were made earlier. Um, if, we're, if we're in this higher inflation environment, how do you think that kind of plays into uh, the risk to the overall industry? And are you tailoring your underwriting processes uh, according to that? Um, you know, Kevin, it'd be great if you, uh, if you can, uh, if you have any thoughts to that. Not a lot to chime in there that we're, we're primarily on the B2B side and most of what we're doing is in the secured finance side. So we don't have a lot of access to, to the consumer side where inflation would provide a little bit more of that pressure <laughs> side. So we still remain bullish on, uh, on, on our segments and, and, and where we've been um, with the, with, with, again, I'm primarily focusing on commercial and primarily focusing on secured. Anyone else um, that would have thoughts on that question? Yeah, I, I could chime in. I, I mean, we oftentimes we lending to lenders, they have a credit policy. We approve any changes have to kind of flow through us for approval as well. Um, you know, sometimes there are, you know, if they can't get a certain for, you know, TDSR or certain servicing ratios that they're perhaps assuming a rent or they're assuming a payment of X, I, I could see that playing in where, you know, maybe those, maybe those numbers should be ratcheted up because you know what, there is inflation and things are, it is more expensive out there. And so uh, perhaps those ratios need to come down as far as a, a servicing perspective. But um, again, from, from us, we're lending to that lender and, and again, relying on them and their underwriting policies to uh, to manage that, uh, the inflation side of things. And not to mention the capital that they have invested into the business as the actual layer. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Definitely. Uh, Eamon? I don't know if you have any additional thoughts to that fact. Yeah, I think just tying it back to, to proper industry analysis and sizing up your potential borrowers um, or even resizing up your current borrowers, um, you know, some industries will be hit harder than others, right? And that's, that's just the reality of it, uh, depending on who are the end borrowers of the... Of the Thank you. Um, 
so yeah, I think it's just, you know, proper industry analysis. Uh, I mean, look, we're, we're a private debt fund. So, you know, where the banks are expecting you to be run with precision and, you know, excellence. And I mean, that's our job to help you get to that point. So we really help you uh, along that way. And, you know, and the point being that, sorry, I forgot my point. I totally went in a different direction. I apologize. That, that, that's okay. I think uh, I think uh, we got the gist of it uh, uh, in how it, how it related to inflation. So, um, why don't we get to some other um, uh, get to some other questions here? Um, as someone asked about uh, whether or not our our BMO representative uh, it was planned to have a blue wall. So he, uh, I think, that as a lot of us are, we are working from home. So that is a blue wall in his uh, <laughs> in his home. So. Uh, we can probably, unless Chris had some special insights to that, we can probably move on. Um, the I, In regards to contact information, all of our LinkedIn profiles, the links for our LinkedIn profiles are on the website. Um, uh, so the person that asked for contact information, feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn. Um, that uh, is probably the easiest and most efficient way um, to, to reach us. Um, just going through here. Um, Sports betting, um, it's now getting, um, uh, you know, re regulated in provinces now and, and, and the like. Has this come up as a, a subsector that you're looking at at all um, in, in the industry? Um, I don't think we've seen it yet um, in, in terms of a potential client of ours. Um, um, but, uh, you know, open out to, uh, to anybody who would want to answer that question. It's a non-starter non for us. Um, we we kind of haven't uh, haven't looked into the space yet. So, so some of the industries there, you know, we're fairly agnostic, but uh, some of the industries we don't look at are cannabis and uh, and haven't looked at or considered sports betting as yet. So it's a kind of a non-starter for us. Yeah, at this point, we haven't done our homework um, until it becomes a more stable type of asset class. We're not going to be delving in anytime soon. Justin, anything on your side? Yeah, similar sports betting, gaming, you know, all that. We haven't done our homework yet, but if uh, someone wanted to come teach me and figure out a way that uh, we could provide capital, I, I'd be all ears. Perfect. Um, just uh, going through. I think we covered the deep general third-party DD requirements for the banks and specialty lending. I don't know if there's anything that we didn't cover. Uh, there was a lot of items that that the team uh, focused in on, unless if you, the, the panelists mention it uh, or uh, have any thoughts on additional third party DD requirements that would be typically applicable uh, on especially lending transaction that wasn't mentioned. Open question for the panel. No. No, like third party is in we're not doing our own DD. Is that because? I presume that's the question. Yes, a uh, uh, third party DD requirements. Yeah. You know, I would say most transactions we're doing our own due diligence and very few that uh, we will get a third party engaged. Yeah, that's that's typically what we have seen as well. Um, so I think that's uh, that's the. Uh, so um, this one's an interesting question. You know, we've obviously seen a rush uh, to digitization and the use of technology and lenders. I mean, you know, anything related to e-commerce lending, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, largely taken a huge boom um, as a result of COVID. You know, how has that changed any of your underwriting or portfolio review processes as well, the technology aspect of it? We didn't really touch on that. Who wants to handle that question? I'll jump in. I mean, for us, it's the story, right? Do the, do the operators know the industry? Um, you know, what is the story there? I mean, I think a, there's a lot of great technologies that can help amplify and run things smoother, but if it's technology as a business, um, I mean, it's going to come down to, to the operators and then, you know, you get into execution risk and then it becomes more of a tech question, you know, in tech, you're kind of first or, or you're dead. So it's not a simple answer i guess there's 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 it's multi multifaceted for sure so anybody else wants to build on that i i think i'm back so i don't know if you guys can hear me we can hear you now chris thanks yeah finally sorry about that guys 
I, I, I mean, we, we don't use a lot of tech at BMO, kind of the, that's been amplified through through COVID, but what we're finding is that our underlying uh, lenders are have, have moved to tech, right? And and we, we, we finance, we finance, frankly, lenders that lend to tech companies. So they kind of pride themselves on understanding the APIs and all the connections and things of that nature. So yeah, so like we, we, we've seen, we've seen a move to kind of adjudication that that's now more automated which, which is interesting a, a little scary frankly and, and from from BMO's point of view understanding what what those kind of uh, what the secret sauce is behind that credit algorithm is is always interesting to, to try to uncover um, and 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 again just just more integrations with with kind of Equifax and 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 different government feeds that, that provide uh, insights Just when he was getting to the good stuff, help score credit now is 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 definitely interesting. People are have, have adapted in, in various ways you would never expected, but uh, that, that's what I'm seeing. Um, I don't know if, if if Justin or Kevin are seeing anything similar. Yeah, along those lines, like you might have underwritten a transaction, or one of our lenders might have underwritten a transaction with you know ten data inputs, and now it's you know easily over a hundred, and it happens a lot quicker. So it's it's yeah, it's challenging to understand. You know, what's the value between that input and that input, and and uh, try to parse that all out, and and for us understanding. But again, it's a lot of it is relying on them as the boots on the ground and understanding their market as best as they can. Perfect. I think we have time for um, uh, one more question. Um, this is actually an interesting question. Um, ESG. Um, obviously a hot topic uh, these days in anything that we do, uh, the companies are focusing in on it. How have you factored ESG in terms of your underwriting uh, procedures and the like as well? It hasn't been a, a full stop for us. I mean, we've kind of obviously got our own internal policies and, and, and values and so on that, that we kind of, you know, put ourselves towards and, and kind of just look at, you know, opportunities in, in maybe a similar vein. Um, so I can't say that there's a hard and fast rule um, per se with respect to ESG and it's, it's evolving for sure. Um, so for example, we, maybe we've got some clients in, in kind of the oil and gas space that are providing services and, and, a lot, and other items in our traditional asset-based lending portfolio. Um, but yeah, no, they, I don't know that we have a, a hard and fast rule or anything that's set out yet other than following our own values for now. Yeah, we're a little bit different. Uh, we're a little more sensitive to ESG issues uh we've turned down coal deals we'll turn down it will be a non-starter depending on you know there's a spectrum right uh, of esg right is it coal or is it like you know a, a, a gas station or something that's you know it's still gonna be phased up but maybe you know 20 years from now 30 years from now so i mean we're sensitive to the topic uh, we're mindful of it and uh, it depends where it falls on the spectrum for us uh, Chris or Justin? Uh, honestly, I, I I don't see it much. So so nothing nothing Agreed. really much to add. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I mean, we, we like to all have aligned interests and obviously have headline risk that we're always mitigating, but um, haven't seen much of it. Perfect. Well, I think um, we are just out of time. Um, and, uh, and uh, I think we can, you know, first of all, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I think uh, everybody gave some great insights. Um, I'm sure the attendees appreciated when I was looking at the, at the participant list, I think we had uh, 63 participants at one point. So there was a lot of, a lot of uh, great engagement and uh, very much appreciate all the insights from the, from our esteemed panelists. So thank you very much. To everybody, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll hand it back over to Danielle for her closing remarks. Yeah, I just quickly want to say thank you to all of you. It was an incredible panelists and Karen G for moderating this discussion. And thank you to everyone who joined today uh, and asked all these great questions. If we didn't have time to get one of your questions answered, I'm sure you can follow up directly with any of these panelists over LinkedIn, or you can feel free to email us and we can connect you. And of course, we invite everyone to become a member of the CLA and participate in the FinTech lending community. And of course, to continue to attend our upcoming events, you can find them at lendersevents.com. But with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you.